Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to yet another Thursday lunchtime lecture um, from the Church's Conservation Trust. Um, it's great to be welcoming you all back with us. Um, do use that comment box there on Facebook. Do let us know where you're watching from. Do tell us especially if this is the first time that you are joining us. But once again, it's very, very good to have you with us. Now, um, before I pass you on to Cindy, um, I'm just going to talk you through quickly how these lectures work. Um, so if you are joining us for the first time, hopefully what I'm about to say um, will make joining in the future a bit easier. Um, so firstly, our lunchtime lectures are always free of charge to watch and enjoy. We make recordings of them and those are also available for you to watch free of charge. So we never charge um, you to access them. Um, we don't put any paywalls in place. So if you ever see anyone posting any links telling you to watch an external website or on a different Facebook page, please do not click it. Um, it could be cyber criminals trying to scam you. Um, as I said, our lectures are always free of charge to watch and enjoy. Now we've created a video which tells you and shows you actually how you can like and follow our page. And if you do that, um, Facebook will send you a notification whenever, we're, whenever we go live with these lectures. So um, do watch that. If you've got any problems or can't find that link, send us a direct message or a comment in this feed below and we'll send you a message with the link. But as I said, um, if you've got any questions, do let us know. Now, use that comment box throughout the lecture because one of the best features of these lectures is at the end of the talk, there is plenty of time for you to ask our guest lecturer your questions. So please do make use of that throughout. Um, if you like these lectures, please do hit the like button, do share them with your friends and family, um, but please do consider making a donation to support our work in caring for historic churches across England. We currently have 356 in our care, and that is likely to increase um, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, one of the, the churches you've just seen there, which is a vesting from Loham, that cost um, several hundred thousand pounds um, when it came into our care, and we spend um, each year just on that church, um, around £5,000 on maintenance and that can vary between all of our churches Some of our churches and um, we spend over £8,000 per year on just regular um, maintenance so every donation you make does go towards helping us care for these historic churches on behalf of the nation. Now in return um, basically as a result of the popularity of these lectures we've launched a special membership offer so if you join us by direct debit from as little as £3.50 a month um, we're sending all of our new members a free copy of Matthew Burns Beautiful Churches book. I know a lot of people have already taken up this offer and they've been receiving their book so if you have received your book and you like it um, do let us know um, what you think of the book in the comment box below. But as I said, if you've got any questions or if you can't find links, just send us a message and I myself or my colleagues will be on hand to help you. Now today we're joined once again by Dr Cindy Wood, who is a lecturer at the University of Winchester. So we really do appreciate her taking time out of her teaching schedule as the university has gone back to term now. So we do, we are most grateful for her taking time to do a lecture for us today. Now Cindy's going to be talking to us today about um, a fascinating topic which I absolutely adore, is purgatory. Um, so Cindy, I'm, I'm going to pass over to you, um, but if anyone, if you've got any questions, please do let us know. Am I there, George? Yeah. Lovely. OK, well, thank you very much. Um, thank you for inviting me back. Um, talking about a very different subject today um, about the medieval guide to escaping purgatory, um, which is a bit odd, really, because nobody actually ever escaped purgatory in the medieval period, apart from saints and newborn babies. But we're looking at the physical evidence for this um, belief in the late medieval period. So what was purgatory? Um, purgatory was the third place. Um, in the geography of death, you have heaven and hell, and, and purgatory is the bit in the middle. And it's where um, your soul had to suffer the uh, purgation for your sins between your death and the day of final judgment. And this is normally associated with fire. Um, and everyone expected to um, have some degree of suffering because um, you had venial sin, sins that could be redeemed through this process. Um, but if you suffered from mortal sin, you know, murder, you, you had no hope of redemption. Um, and everyone had to go there no matter how much effort you made, but nobody knew how long it would last. 
Um, and so by the, the late medieval period, we find there's lots of strategies um, that were in place to help relieve some of this suffering, although not all of it. Um, and we can see physical evidence of different aspects of this. And, and this is um, one of my favorite images. This is the doom painting in St. Thomas's Church, Salisbury um, on the chancel arch. Which be, is um, your, restored. your um, PowerPoint isn't sharing at the moment. So oh. I don't know if you want to just check the screens up. Yeah, let me go. Am I not sharing? Sorry, thank you. Ah, right. That should be better, should it? Perfect. Perfect. And right. OK, so this is actually a, a Chantry Chapel. We'll come back to that in a moment. Um, sorry about technology. <laughs> um, so this is the idea of the third place. Um, and this is the um, doom painting in St Thomas's, recently restored. And this is the image of the day of final judgment when Jesus sat in front of the heavenly Jerusalem in front of his apostles um, and the dead are received and their souls are judged. Um, and so if you were saved after your time in purgatory, you would pass on Jesus's right hand into heaven and you were greeted by the angels. But should you have, um, you, whether you're judged to go to hell and you pass on Jesus's left hand into hell, you can see that it's depicted by um, the image of a, a dragon or a lizard's mouth. And what I love about this St. Thomas imagery is that it's, it appears so democratic in that we have bishops and monks and princes being dragged into hell very nicely. <laughs> um, so what was purgatory? And the idea of purgatory, and tori in Latin means the place where, so it's the place where the soul underwent purgation. But the idea of the place where developed over the first thousand years really of um, Christianity, very early in Christianity, it was believed that the actions of the living could affect the soul of the dead. Um, it was mentioned by St. Paul, I think in one of his letters to, to the Corinthians. Um, and so there was a very early uh, belief that the living could affect the fate of the soul. And so, for example, we see at the Synod uh, of Attigny in 762 that all the abbots and the bishops who attended this all agreed that should one of them die, they would all um, celebrate 100 masses for the soul of their dead compatriot um, when they'd heard about it. So there is this idea, you know, by 762 that those actions made a difference. And so by the time you get to about a thousand, um, Jacques Le Goff has worked, you know, has done some work on this. And the idea of purgatory, the place where purgation took place, was well established. Um, but it didn't become official doctrine straight away within the Roman Catholic Church. It was mentioned in the important 1215 Fourth Lateran Council held by Innocent III, but it became official doctrine in 1274 at the Council of Lyon. Um, but even by then, the idea that actions of the living and the prayers of the living could affect the soul in this process of purgation was well established. Um, and you could say that monasteries were the early example of that, in that if you were in the medieval um, tripartite system of the praying man, the working man and the fighting man, um, the praying men, the monks, were responsible as powerhouses of prayer, and they were praying for the other people in society that couldn't do their prayers because they were working or fighting. Um, and so you could see a monastery as a very early idea with that. And so if you can't do the, the prayers yourself or you need other people to pray for you, i.e. a monk, you would then give them gifts to enable them to live to do these um, prayers for you. And the first example we can clearly see of, of the idea of these prayers beyond a monastic context is um, Henry de Bois, Bishop of Winchester in the 12th century in Marwell. Well, he had specially uh, appointed four chaplains to, to say these prayers for his soul. So by the time we get to the late medieval period, say from about 1300 onwards, we can see that the idea of intercession 
um, into in interceding for the soul in purgatory was well established and the prayers of the living alleviated some of the suffering of those in purgatory but it could not end their suffering in purgatory it merely um, lessened it and the most efficient way of doing this the most efficacious way of doing this was to actually have a mass celebrated for your soul um, and, and that is the core of really intercession but in addition to that we see acts of mercy um, and some of these um, actions can still be seen in physical um, examples which we'll have a look at um, but in this period the role of of people within society was clearly understood um, the poor, the prayers of the poor were considered very valuable and therefore gifts to the poor um, led the poor to know that they had to pray for the person giving um, whatever it was they received um, and we need to look at both audiences, those who receive gifts and those who actually donated them. Um, I would say at this point that there is always, whenever I talk about this with, with um, different groups, there is always an idea that the ch it was a bit of a conspiracy by the church to get money out of people. Um, and, and that isn't the case um, in, in terms of the idea of intercession for the soul, it was something that was believed by everybody in society and, and it was not um, a, a conspiracy. Many of the examples I'll be talking about were actually set up by churchmen themselves. So the mass is central to the medieval religious experience and is also central to the idea of intercession. Um, and a mass is the recreation of the Last Supper and the sacrifice um, of Jesus on Good Friday. And the, the most important part of the mass is the elevation of the host, um, at which point transubstantiation occurs and you were in the presence of Jesus. Um, and, and it was important, that point was the important point in a, in a mass. Um, but a, a priests could only celebrate one a day um, which did hinder some of the efforts to have extra masses celebrated. Um, and it was quite interesting in this period, you did not participate in a mass except on Easter Sunday as a member of the laity, a member of non-church communities. Um, while a mass was celebrated, you it just had to be there because um, then you were in the presence of Jesus at the elevation of the host, but you took no part. You did not necessarily have to see it. Um, you could hear the sacring bell, which they rang just before the elevation, or you could have them celebrated for you um, at a distance. Um, it was the normal process was that in Holy Week every year, members of a parish would would confess their sins and then they would receive communion, i.e. the bread, no wine on Easter Sunday. And it was considered very odd in this period if you wanted to participate in the mass more than that. Um, Henry Beaufort, uh, Margaret Beaufort, Henry VII's mother, um, used to receive it once a month and she was considered very odd. So the mass, if you enable a mass to be uh, performed, that was sufficient for your soul. And why was that? Because it was an increase in divine service and an increase in divine service was believed to be pleasing to God. Um, and so if you enabled a mass to be an extra mass to be celebrated by giving money or property, um, you endow it, that is what is known as a chantry. Um, and if you had sufficient funds, you would build a physical space in which the chantry could be performed or celebrated, and that is the chantry chapel. And chantry chapels have affected the footprint of churches, parish, um, and monastic and, and all the other types of churches in, in the late medieval period. And a great number of additional chapels um, added to churches often in the 15th century were chantries, even though that function may well have been lost. So the most common form of a chantry was a temporary one. And while these are were very, very common. We see very little priv, uh, physical evidence for them. Mostly they're mentioned in wills. And um, so you would leave, say, five pounds 
for masses to be celebrated for your soul or you would say I want a priest to celebrate masses for a year or two years depending on how much money you could leave and so they're temporary they're limited by this this time or money and very very popular and you could set up these temporary chantries in any number of churches if you wish to and because they were temporary they had no physical space of their own and they were celebrated at an existing altar and so you might have the, the altar of St Stephen that could have five chantries at it um, and they would take place one after the other and all masses had to be celebrated between daybreak and 11 a.m and so they're a bit of a timeshare really an altar could be on that basis and the only physical evidence in churches we can see really are where um, the number of altars has reduced in a church and all we see are the piscina which is um, what you can see in the photo in the picture there <clears throat> which is a little basin in which the surplus fluid from a mass is is placed in this and it goes down in back into consecrated ground um, and as the Reformation takes place and there's fewer altars, you can see these piscinas often in different parts of the church and they always indicate where an altar used to be. Um, and it was also considered really useful to um, have quite a lot of um, chant chantry masses to be celebrated for you at the time of your death. And so you have what's called the month's mind, the first, thir first 30 days after your death. And we find a lot of wills ask for a substantial number of masses to be celebrated in this first month to help you in ease your way into purgatory. So Robert Gurland asked for a thousand to be um, celebrated for his soul after his death, um, which sounds an awful lot, but actually was a fairly, um, not an unusual amount. Um, but when you get to Henry V, he wanted actually 10,000 masses to be celebrated within his month's mind. I can't believe they were ever celebrated because the, the physical logistics of getting this done um, is, is quite amazing <laughs> and probably quite, um, quite impossible, really. Um, and you can see here that he then specifies what type of mass that he also wanted. So you've got those for the Holy Trinity, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Five Wounds of Christ, which is a very popular um, motif in the later medieval period, and you know the Twelve Apostles. Um, but there is this this impetus after death, for this first thirty days, to have a lot of these masses to be celebrated. So they were the temporary ones, which had no perpetual foundation but you could found a perpetual chantry. Um, and that normally involved some kind of transfer of, of a larger sum of money or property to the church that's going to house your chantry to pay for the priest, to celebrate the mass for their clothing, their vestments, candles, wine, the, um, and all the accoutrements you'd need. Um, and these, these then narrow the opportunities for people to do it because you do need a substantial amount of money to be able to do this. And they're very rarely found in wills because they are normally built in the lifetime of the founder. Um, and they occur in all kinds of churches um, and we see them surviving today. So this is um, the, the perpetual chantry of Abbot Parker, um, one of the last um, monastic um, heads of the house of because this is formerly a, a monastery now Gloucester Cathedral and it's important because he's actually next to the um, the tomb of Edward the Edward the second who at this point is a quasi saint so he's got quite a nice location um, and so we do see some evidence in wills but not for their foundation so this is the remains of um, Walter Hung the Water Lord Hungerford's Chantry Chapel in Salisbury Cathedral um, which was an iron one between those two pillars the the tomb is um, a living lie I'm afraid um, but we can go into that later um, and in his will he said he wanted to be buried in his chapel which he had caused to be built within the second bay from the belfry on the north side of the church this chapel did survive the reformation and was actually the the chapel that the mayor of Salisbury used to sit in to listen to services but was dismantled at the end of the 18th century and was rebuilt here um, by a descendant of Walter's wife now we do have very little evidence for these chantry chapels within parish churches 
Um, and this is Ludlow. And um, in Ludlow, there's evidence for four wooden chantry chapels built between the pillars. Um, and we see in, in the pictures the faint paintings that, that were their reredos that, that, uh, behind their altars. And we have really good church warden records, which um, tell us how these were dismantled um, after 1547. And they sold the wood and they sold the space because what you find in the 16th century is the liturgy has changed and the nave um, and the sermons mean that people want to sit. And so in, in parish churches where these chapels were in the way of that changing liturgy, they were dismantled. And we have really good evidence here for Ludlow Parish Church. Um, and you also have surviving bits and bobs put together. This is in Burford. We don't know who founded this, but we have a stone reredos with a wooden chapel built round it. And that wooden chapel is probably not the original chapel to that reredos. Um, and the reredos may well be associated with the rood screen of that parish church. Um, so we, we have to be careful because they can often be pieced together later on. Um, but some are built within the chapel, uh, within the church, and some extend the footprint. Um, and in the late medieval period, we have very few, in England, we are, after 1300, we only have five monastic churches founded. But what we do find is we have collegiate churches founded. Um, and these are outside of the parish system, and they are built by individuals or families, um, and they are enormous chantries in effect, because they were built for the family um, and for the prayers to intercede for the soul of the family and also normally become the mausolea as well. So this is the remains of Fotheringhay. The East End was taken down in the 16th century. Um, and this is where um, Richard, the Duke of York, was reburied by his son, Edward IV, and was um, a burial place for some of the Yorkist dynasty. Now, these were heavily, really expensive to, to set up in that they were had a dean and canons. You have to have provide enough land with income to provide for all of these people. But the biggest collegiate church in the late medieval period was the rebuilding of St George's at Windsor Castle by Edward IV. This current building was started um, in 1475. The original St George's Chapel is this bit at the end, but was that is the Victorian rebuilding. Again, set up by Dean and Canons, and not only did it form a chantry function for Ch Edward the fourth himself he also had his own chantry chapel within it as well and this is a really good example of a church built with chantry chapels in mind because you can see how the external chapels were actually designed and built um, to become chantries edward the fourth chantry here by the high altar is a two-story um, building and he enabled his best friend lord hastings to have his chantry very close. Oh, I've gone, I've gone back, sorry. Um, and the Exeter Chantry here is that of his sister, Anne. Um, and what's interesting with Anne in the foundation documents, this was founded in 1481, is that um, in the foundation document, it clearly says that halfway through the celebration of the mass, which was in Latin, the priest had to turn around to any congregation and say in English, this Chantry Mass is celebrated for Anne, um, Duchess of Exeter, and then turn around and carry on um, in, in the Latin. So it tells us really that there is this impetus to encourage people to remember in their prayers the person that this is being celebrated for. So Edward IV's Chantry is this, um, there's two bays here, this is the wooden one, um, which is where the Queen is a private chapel still for the Queen. This is Hastings, ah, going backwards again. Uh, this is the Hastings Chantry in the middle, and that's the, the Exeter Chantry on the right. There were chantries founded in monasteries, and these are really difficult to find, and we only ever see them in those monastic churches which survived the dissolution, um, and there's not many of those. Um, many were perpetual foundations and um, had personnel, sometimes monks of the house and sometimes external um, priests. Um, and sometimes it was in a monastic chantry, the challenge was actually for the monks to remember who 
they were saying the mass is for. <clears throat> and so this is where the vestments become very important and they're often um, personalized to remind the monk who they're actually meant to be saying the mass for. Um, this example here is the All Saint Christchurch Priory and it is of Margaret Pole, Countess of, Ex uh, Countess of Salisbury, daughter of um, Clarence, the Duke of George, the Duke of Clarence, brother of Richard III and Edward IV, which probably was why in 1541 she was executed by Henry VIII. And he sent commissioners down to deface this chapel. And if you ever get a chance to go in there, the roof bosses have still got the chisel marks where his commissioners had taken her out of any of the imagery and, and destroyed her coat of arms as well. But this has survived because Christchurch became a parish chapel afterwards. But the big problem with monastic chantries is that they left no footprint. Um, the, the, these chapels are built and they're built on existing foundations so they don't survive in the archaeological record. Winchester Cathedral survives as, um, as a cathedral. It was a monastic house. Um, and like uh, Ely, uh, sorry, like Norwich and Durham, we do find some surviving chantry chapels within these. Um, and Winchester is, is unusual in that it has seven chantry chapels, six of which are this cage chantry style, these small ones built between the two pillars of the church. As you can guess, this is my special area of subject. But what's interesting about these is that they're all the bishops of the, minis, of the monastic house. Um, none of the priors of, the, uh, of St. Swithin's Priory that ran the, the cathedral were able to be buried in the, in the cathedral. Secular cathedrals, those run by dean and canons, also have these surviving in different places. Um, so Salisbury not only has Waterlord Hungerford's, but also has Edmund Audley's close to the high altar. And Wells Cathedral has um, three surviving Chantry chapels. And this is Beckington's, again with the stone reredos, this time encased in iron. So the ones I've been talking about in terms of perpetual chantries have been elite, um, but they're not the only way that you could have chantry masses celebrated for your soul. And one of these is actually the religious guilds. Um, and these are effectively um, chantries in themselves in that for a small subscription, you could um, join a, a guild and the priest employed by the guild would then celebrate mass for, for members past and present. And so religious guilds, which are also um, suppressed in 1547 with chantries, were very, very popular. You had the great social aspect of your annual feast day um, and you guaranteed mourners when you die at your funeral. Um, but these were a way of the non-elites in society for normally a very small amount of money to have chantry masses celebrated for their soul. Um, and this is St Mary's and the um, Chantry, I hope you don't do the, the Chantry chap, the Guild Chapel is here, gradually incorporated into the parish church. And you can see all the extra chapels that have been built around the edge of this church. And this is a common feature of the 15th century. And a lot of these will have been private chantries of different families. So they're very common. Chantries are extremely common in, in both perpetual and um, temporary but their remains are actually very very limited um, and with by including the guilds as a chantry which they were because they're endowed masses um, you can see that vast uh, parts of society were able to access them but all of this is about the mass and the increase in divine service um, but there were other ways that were within society that you could help your soul after death and these are the acts of mercy. And there's two types, there's the temporal and the spiritual. And the temporal have left a, a large amount of, of evidence for them and the spiritual not so much. So we'll have a quick go through these. So it was important if you were able to help people, you had to help the poor. Um, and so the acts of feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty and clothing the naked were important acts of charity in this period. And we see this especially um, in funerals. 
And it was not uncommon in a medieval will to see that I want to have 12, normally in groups of 12, because there were 12 apostles, 12 men and or women uh, attend my funeral. I want them dressed and you could say what color clothes they wore. And I want them fed and given drink afterwards. Um, and, th and they would keep the clothes and they would get fed. Um, and, and therefore the poor that received these goods would know they have to pray for the person who has, has provided it. So we see this um, in wills for funerals and we also see it for obits, which is the anniversary mass. And people would leave money um, for the same um, celebration by the poor at their anniversary mass. And you'd have probably have someone going round to town or a community ringing a bell to, to let everybody know that a certain obit would be celebrated the next day and that there were, um, was food and drink available. A very, very common feature for this period. And you have this, this symbiotic relationship be between the poor that know they can get these gifts and they have to pray for the person who donated them. Um, and the, the donor knows that the prayer, prayers of the poor will come because they provided it. Uh, another big act of mercy is the sheltering the homeless. And we can see this, especially in, in almshouses and hospitals in the medieval period. The term hospital is much more fluid in the past and did not necessarily have anything to do with medical care. So this is St Cross Hospital in Winchester, one of the largest, founded by Henry de Blois, and then refounded in the 15th century by Henry Beaufort. So there's two sets of brothers who live here. Um, and they were provided with somewhere to live, they're given shelter, um, but they also then were required as part of that receipt of, of shelter to pray every day um, in the church for their benefactor. Um, and so there is this, the relationship. What in, in reality, St Cross is actually a retirement home for the servants of the bishops of Winchester anyway, but their requirement is that they had to pray for the soul of their benefactor. Another example is God's House in Uelm, founded by Alice Chaucer, Duchess of Suffolk and her husband. Um, Alice was the granddaughter of Geoffrey Chaucer, the poet. And what you have here is a group of almshouses attached to the church where Alice is buried in great splendor on the left and as, and as a, as a cadaver on the right. This is an example of a cadaver, a transy tomb. Um, and the requirement of the people living in the almshouse is that they pray for their benefactor every day as well. Visiting the sick, looking after the sick is another responsibility of those who could afford it. Um, and so sometimes these are called hospitals or hospitiums, sometimes they're infirmaries, and we can see these in um, the plans of monastic estates, the cloistral um, estates. <clears throat> and so the monks had infirmaries that looked after their, their own, and they also had those for um, the laity. You can see here on the left, the houses for strangers and their own hospitium. And in Ely, they have the almonry on the outside of their precinct that allowed people coming in without coming into the precinct, um, but they could try to look after them. So we see that um, the almonries and the almshouses in the hospitals all had the same sort of responsibility of care and alms giving for the poor. Um, it was done by monastic houses, but it's also done by secular founders as well. Another one is to visit the imprisoned. I'm not sure many people actually imprisoned the, uh, visited the imprisoned here, but they, they provided them, and we have will evidence for this, uh, with food and drink. Um, like many periods in the past, in the medieval um, period, if you were in prison, you had to make sure you had your own food and drink, none was provided. Um, and it was um, an act of mercy to provide these people with uh, food and drink. And the prisoners on their half would then pray for the person giving it. So you have this constant um, relationship. The other one is to bury the dead. Now, normally the dead are buried within the parish churchyard, um, but we can see this, this um, act of mercy clearly in the Black Death. Um, so Walter Manny um, 
brought the land around Smithfield, West Smithfield, and provided the city of London with one of its two plague burials. The other one is over here by the Tower of London, East Smithfield. And <clears throat> he provided the land and London were able to bury uh, a large number of their dead from the plague in this period. So he provided it and um, although he dies in 1372, before he died, um, a Carthusian monastery was established on top of this graveyard whose job was to pray for the souls of the dead. Um, and they would also provide the prayers for their founder, the Walter Manny, and the City of London uh, would also include Walter Manny in their prayers for providing somewhere for their dead. So you have this, it's not just a, a single relationship, they're often quite complicated. Now the acts of spiritual mercy do tend to be much more difficult to find in physical evidence, but the biggest one we see is the teaching of the ignorant. Um, and so this includes schools and the two universities in medieval England, Oxford and Cambridge. Um, uh, in the late medieval period, these are still belonging to the church. And what you have is a, a diocese might have a hall or a college in Oxford and Cambridge where they send the monks and the priests from their diocese um, to, to study. Um, and it's very much a church based environment at this point. But at a lower level, many chantry priests in the parish context were actually also teachers. And it was a requirement of their position that they had to teach boys and sometimes girls their very basic um, education. And a lot of these took place in rooms above porches in parish churches, um, which still survive today. But the biggest example we have are the two dual foundations of Winchester College and New College Oxford, Eton College and King's College Cambridge. Um, Eton and King's were founded by Henry VI in the 15th century, um, but Winchester College and New College Ox Oxford were the first dual um, foundation founded in the 1380s and 90s um, by, by William Wickham. And he was very, very busy in getting endowments for these two establishments. Um, and at heart, these are both chantries because the foundation documents clearly say that if the endowments fail, the last people to leave would be the priest celebrating for his soul and the choristers. The first ones to go would be the scholars. So we can see here that there is a real impetus for benefit to William Wickham's soul because every person there, scholars, fellows, um, priests, had to pray every day for the soul of their benefactor, William Wickham. Um, and Winchester College was founded um, for poor boys of the Diocese of um, Winchester and is in a response to the um, long-term effects of the Black Death, where a large percentage of priests died because they were visiting the sick to give last rites. And therefore it was felt the quality of priests coming through after that was, was going down. And this was an effort to improve the quality of the learning of the priests. New College Oxford, exactly the same. The boys from Winchester were encouraged to go to New College Oxford. And again here, the endowments are there, but if they failed, it was the priests that were last to go. Um, and so we have that dual foundation. And the, the spiritual um, act of mercy of praying for the living and the dead, we can see runs through all of these actions. Um, and they help both the, the donor and the beneficiary. And it's really the idea of this cult of the dead in the late medieval period. And we see it in more practical senses as well in helping the wayfarer. Um, and the provision of bridges, um, improved roadways, hospitality for travellers was all an act of mercy. And the idea was that if you went over a bridge, you pray for the person who provided it. And so we see in the bottom picture, Bradford on Avon actually had its own chapel as well, later a prison. Um, and the one in Sturminster Marshall, which is still there, um, you are, if you provide a bridge, you, guarantee, you, you gain benefit for your aiding of the wayfarer. 
and the ultimate of this obviously is London Bridge in, um, in London. It had its own guild for the bridge. It had chapels on the north and the south side, as well as the chapel of Thomas Beckett in the middle. Um, and there were prayers offered for the benefactors and you made a gift to the guild as you went over it. Um, the guild accounts still exist. Um, and it is what is something intentionally so practical actually has this intercessionary um, meaning as well. Um, this is St Mary's in Bexley um, in Kent and there is a will from 1407 by Henry Castillon who, who's, whose will says quite clearly I want to mend a certain way between Black Fen Street extending and begin, beginning from Bladen to Black Fen Gate a, a pound 20 shillings um, and this is the road here this is the church here and this is the road that still exists to Black Fen um, I put this in because I've done some work on, on this church, which is now my brother-in-law's church, actually. <laughs> um, but what I like about this will as well, he also leaves his bees um, to the church in return for candles. And he wants these candles placed before the image of the Virgin. And, and candles should never be, and light should never be underestimated in this period in that those candles then become his, effectively his proxy and he gains benefit for providing light in front of them. And they also represented him in front of those lights. And so you often see references to lights and candles in, in, in wills and in funeral requirements. And, and that is a really important aspect of this period. Another one is the, um, some wills offer money for young women to get married, providing them with a dowry um, to enable them to be outside of sin. Um, and again, the recipient of this will be expected to include the donor in their prayers. Um, and actually traveling around a church, if you visit a church, if you walk around it, the tombs and the brasses that you would see would be expected to elicit your prayers as you passed. Um, and you would be expected as part of your spiritual duty, whether you're elite, non-elite, poor or rich, to pray for the souls of the dead or as a matter of course. Um, but some tombs and some brasses actually have a little reminder. So you find these speech bubbles on some brasses that ask for um, inclusion in their prayers. And, you, and if you can read them, you can often see a misere anime mea, which means mercy on my soul. Um, and you can read these and know that that's actually an invocation to prayer. Um, and the Chantry Chapel of Robert Harris, who's a, a priest in Christchurch Priory, actually has the same invocation carved in stone along the top of his Chantry Chapel. Um, and it says in, in, in English, it's in vernacular, it's not in Latin. The Lord King of Bliss have mercy on him that make this Robert Harris. Again, a direct um, call for prayer. So hopefully you've got an idea that there is this in this period, there is. Um, lots of different ways that people could elicit prayers um, and masses that benefited the soul after death dependent on funds social status you know your job in life but everyone in society more or less had an opportunity to develop strategies that would help their soul after death whether it was you prayed for somebody and gained benefit or whether it was you were able to help other people and expected prayers in, in return. Um, and all of these were expected and understood within different sections of society. Um, and prayers of the poor were very valuable. Um, and so there's a lot of practical ways of, that these go on. The only thing I haven't mentioned are indulgences um, because really they were just the purchase power of somebody to be able to purchase an indulgence which would give you a certain amount of time off of purgatory 40 days was the normal because that's the you could buy a license from a bishop for, for an indulgence 40 days and they were often built bought by churches so they if you gave money to help build their roof they the church could give you 40 days indulgence um i haven't really done too much of those some of them survive in paper form obviously as well but you can see the breadth of society, so many elements within it 
were about the relationship between the poor and the rich within society that were living, but also the relationship between the living and the dead. And when you were living, you would provide these prayers to help the dead with the full expectation that when you died, the living would do it for you. And it was very widespread. So all of this um, comes to a massive halt, although there were issues over purgatory in the reign of Henry VIII, but it's really the second Chantry Act of December 1547, the first year of the reign of Edward VI, that sees the end of it. There is this abrupt rupture in that relationship between the living and the dead um, in 1547, when the second Chantry Act says, uh, this is a great part of superstition and errors in Christian religion, and every chantry, every college, um, every religious guild is shut down. Um, except, and there are exceptions to this, Oxford and Cambridge were able to carry on, St George's was always exempt, and Winchester and Eton College because of their educational function. So what we have is this abrupt change, um, and so to have any reminders of this very, very different liturgy survive in our churches is, is remarkable because they get in the way, they have no function, they are a living embodiment of a, a liturgy that changes so abruptly at that point and never returns really. Um, and the fact that any of them survive at all is remarkable. But when you walk around a church now you, and you see tombs and you see brasses, remember that they're there to elicit your prayers um, in this period. I think that's me. Thank you, George. So, so much, Cindy. That's been <laughs> uh, brilliant. There's loads of brilliant comments coming through still. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm just going to um, stop your screen sharing. So, um, yep. uh, brilliant. Thanks again so much, Cindy. So, everyone, we're now going into question time. So, this is your chance to ask Cindy um, questions. So, I know there's been a few already, but if you've got more, please comment. Um, away and we'll do our best to answer them. If we don't have time to answer them, we'll do our best to get back to you. Um, before we start, um, though, um, once again, everyone, um, just a reminder that if you are enjoying these lectures um, that we do every week and put on free of charge, please do consider making a donation to support our work. Um, as I said, there's a special membership offer running at the moment where you can get a free copy of Matthew Burns' beautiful books. Um, which is a really terrific book. Um, alternative, you can um, text donate. Um, if you donate, uh, you can text CCT to 70331 to give a gift of three pounds, but there's some other methods um, listed in our video description there. But Cindy, um, I'm gonna dive straight in because um, there's been quite a few um, questions already. Um, what was the role of paupers at a funeral? To offer their prayers. Um, the prayers of the poor were considered more valuable than the prayers of the rich. Um, and therefore you you wanted just in the way that you you might want lots of prayers right at the beginning uh, masses at the beginning to help ease your way into purgatory it's the same with the poor it's just that they their prayers were valuable thanks and there's been i'm going to merge a couple of questions here because it, it's a theme that's come up quite a lot so, so we've talked a lot about obviously the rich um and bishops having chantries as you said in winchester yeah. there what about the poor though who prayed for the poor well and that's a Fantastic question. Yes, because every chantry mass, um, it would, and, and you see the foundation documents, they say, I'm going to pray for my wife, the king, the queen, um, my ancestors, my, my um, descendants, and every Christian soul. And every foundation document I've read, and they're not that many, I do appreciate that, always has at the end, and every Christian soul. Um, and so they're included in this idea of divine service being pleased to God. So some people are a little bit more important than others, but everyone is included. Thanks, Cindy. Um, we've got here um, a, a question. So, some, so someone said, presumably there were priests who had been doing specific masses for specific people since before, um, you know, they even became priests um, and before they'd been born and had been taught that these prayers were vital. I would think that it would be pretty tricky for someone to make a final decision to get a particular mass to stop, unless by then all the priests were pretty much just going through the motions. What Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, sometimes the endowments ran out and, they, and the chantry ran out of money. Um, the priests obviously died 
Um, and uh, of, often the foundation document states how quickly they have to, and, and the process by which they reappoint. Um, there, there are quite a lot of bits of evidence about the uh, Chantry priests who, who were quite naughty, um, especially those that lived in groups. And so they, they did used to go down the pub and they were quite um, doing things they shouldn't do, especially with the ladies. Um, so they, they weren't always the best reputation. But at the end of the day, it's um, their soul was in peril if they didn't do what they were meant to do. So there was uh, an impetus for them to do what they're meant to do because for their own soul, if not the soul of the person they're praying for. So, yeah, I mean, human nature being what it is, I can't believe that every chantry priest was equally as devout and um, well behaved as they should have been, but they would have had to be quite good for themselves, if nothing else. Thanks, Cindy. And I think uh, uh, an interesting question tied to endowments is that, you know, are there any that are still active to this day, even if they become secular, that sort of were originally? No. The last, the very last chantries known are those in St George's, Windsor Castle, because they were never suppressed. Um, in 1547, Edward VI collected all the endowments, plate and everything that belonged to the chantries. Um, and that through the records, we can see it either given away or sold. But St George's was exempt. So their chantries actually continued until um, I think the last payment to a chantry priest was about 1630. But it was known by about 1570 that the income that was kind of given the title chantry was actually just to add as an augmentation of their existing salary. So the money that came in from the endowments, which continued in St George's, was just used as part of a salary. Whether the chantry masses were done there is highly, highly unlikely. Uh, but no, in 1547, they were all seized. It's like the dissolution of the monasteries. All their assets were seized by the crown. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Cindy. Um, yeah, I thought what you mentioned about bridges was really interesting. We've had a couple of questions come up about bridges. Um, so someone's asked here, there is a bridge over the Derwent at Derby with a church or chapel at one end. Would this have been one of the endowments you have mentioned? Yes, I'm sure it is. And the person who endowed the, the bridge probably had the chapel built and it's likely that the people passing over the chapel would have given donations to the, to the, to the chapel as well. Yes, it's it's, a, it's a, I love bridges and these and these chapels because there's very little known about them, and it's like Bradford on Avon. If you talk to anyone, they always talk about it being a prison. Well, it was a prison after the dissolution for a little while, but it was actually a chapel because it's a religious. You know, the bridge was a religious duty. Um, they're great. Yes, I think actually I have seen the picture of the Derwent one. There's actually one, the remains of one in Bristol, I think as well. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, Cindy. Um, and I think this is quite interesting. Someone's here said here, was there evidence that individuals still attempted to get prayers said for them after the Reformation? I don't know if you want to jump in on this one. Well, I there's no evidence because they wouldn't, but but um I they they could see what was going to happen. And um I think it's remarkable in what are the, the, the these things called the chantry certificates. So there were two Chantry Acts, one in 1545 by Henry VIII and one in 1547. And Henry VIII and Edward VI sent commissioners round to find out all the chantries, list them, give us the priests and the value. And virtually none of them seemed to have any plate, any vestments. Um, and so I think they'd actually seen what was coming and disposed of things. We'll never know. Um, but why I think that's highly likely is because in the reign of Mary, well, in 1550, the Bishop of London, on behalf of the of government, told every church they had to lose their stone altar and replace it with a table. And so for the first time, the priest stood behind the table facing the congregation. When Mary came back, a, a number of parishes dug their altars out of their churchyards and put them back. <laughs> these stone ones. So, you know, these, these are people who are canny, um, who kind of know what's going on. And I think, um, but n there's no evidence of any of them coming back in the reign of Mary. 
In fact, the only one I know in the reign of Mary is also in Winchester Cathedral, and that's the chantry of Stephen Gardner. He, he died in 1555 and he founded his chantry he, and he asked for it to be built. And um, he leaves 400 pounds for it to be built. And in 1560, the next bishop is, is a, an arch Protestant. And so we know it was built in that period. Whether there were any masses ever said in it, we don't know, but we know that one was built. That's the last one I know about. And jumping on that, I know um, there's, a, there's a lot of writing about there about praying for the dead, and it's sort of some kind I did with um, your colleague Christina Welch from Arsenal mm -hmm. Winchester, but there's some really interesting um, records out there. So if you look, um, certainly post-Reformation, obviously we know physical buildings weren't built, but if you look at writings of priests and bishops, so one of the Carolyn Divines um, was the Bishop of Winchester, uh, Lancelot Andrews. Um, he wrote his precise Divine, and if you read that, th those are his personal prayers, his personal devotions, there's praying for people who have died. So yes. the yes. physical manifestations may have um, stopped, but that doesn't mean that, you know, people in their own personal private devotions didn't continue some kind of prayer. I think there's uh, always been, yeah, some kind of prayers for the dead. It's just not as, as kind of, um, uh, the thing with the late medieval period, they knew if they did this, this and this, they'd be all right. And I think after the Reformation, it becomes much more of a personal relationship and you pray for the dead outside of an institutional way. In fact, the, uh, just realise, remember that if you ever go to Lansing College in Sussex, which was built at the end of the 19th century, the builder of that and his son both put, themselves, put chantries in, but it's Anglican, it's not Catholic. And there's two actually caged chantries one about dated 1901 and 1904 in Lansing College. So uh, everyone, it is worth going to see Lansing College. But um, I know um, we've talked some. There's been a few questions here about asking about current thoughts about purgatory, and I think we, oh. we might have to do another lecture on that. <laughs> something to do about because purgatory is a real huge um, topic, and certainly in the Church of England, there yeah. are you know lots of controversies. But it does. Um, there are people who write about it existing in Church of England doctrine. And, and to be honest, thank you for saying that because I I don't get involved in the theological side. I'm a historian and and a physical historian, and I like physical things. So. So um, the theology I can go a little bit into, but it's not my field. I'll leave that to you, George. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I said, we'll try and get a lecture put in about yes. praying for the dead in the church. Yes. Because um, it's a really interesting topic. And Absolutely. certainly after World War One, there's a huge revival in it. But we'll try and get a lecture put in for that. I think we're going to finish with this question. I think it's a really nice one. Because you mentioned about Chaucer's granddaughter. And someone's put a really interesting question is, can you comment on Chaucer's sceptical view, views on the system? Well, Chaucer writes fiction, and but there is a kernel of truth in that. Um, and like everyone in, in, he wrote a comedy, he wrote something as a, you know, he wrote it in the same time as something called Piers Plowman, which was quite critical. Um, and what he is critical of is the people doing what they're not meant to do, not the idea itself. The pardoner, he doesn't like the pardoner, and that's the person who sells indulgences. And I think that's quite a common feature in the period. Um, he writes in the period when Lollardy is emerging, you know, you, you could perhaps see there is a questioning of some of the, the church there. But what, what he writes about is human nature. And not every human, not every person does everything you're meant to do when you're at the right time and the right thing. And he writes about the idiosyncrasies of people and take the pardoner out of it. I think what he does is criticizes people who aren't doing what they're meant to do according to the social mores of the time. Um, and he does it for effect. So, you know, if I was talking to my students and in fact, I was talking to them about Chaucer only this week, I think with Chaucer, you have to understand that he's pointing out what's wrong, but not everybody's doing what's wrong, but he's pointing it out because it's a work of fiction and he writes for effect. And the wife of Bath is, is a fantastic effect, isn't it? <laughs> that doesn't mean to say every woman in the medieval period acts like the wife of Bath, but some obviously did. Well, Absolutely. Thank you very much, Edith. Um, I see there's been a couple of co comments just quickly coming in about asking about um, where can you see some really interesting um, wall paintings? Um, oh, uh, yes. Um, 
everyone, we're just going to quickly comment in there with a link to our Google Arts and Culture page. Now, this is a free tool. I mean, it allows you to look in high definition at some um, of our churches. And one of the churches you should really look at is um, we've got an exhibition called Saints, Sinners and Socks. And that's um, based at St. Lawrence Church in Broughton. Now, that has some fantastic depictions of doom paintings. It's got um, there. There's a really stunning Pieta there of the Virgin Mary over the broken body of Christ. And the body of Christ is being broken by people gambling and you see some really amazing medieval um, wall paintings there. So do have a look at that link. As I said, we'll comment that um, in a moment. I'm sorry but I couldn't get in my lecture. I really wanted to get in with someone holding his foot. <laughs> <laughs> but Cindy, thank you so much for joining us. Okay. Everyone, thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Thank you for your questions. Again, if this is your first time, we hope you've enjoyed it, but do let us know. If you've had any problems today, access and lecture, again, send us a message and we'll do our best to try and help you and make it as smooth as possible. But once again, these lectures are always recorded. Um, they're free to watch. Um, we've got some links in our description there. But if you can't find the videos, just send us a message and we'll send them to you. Now, next week, we're going to be joined by a folklore um, expert. Mm -hmm. We'll be and joined by Dr. Francis Young. Now he's going to be talking to us about ghosts, witches and monsters in England's churches and churchyards. So it's another great um, talk um, for October. So do join us next week um, for that talk. But Cindy, thank you again once again and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we look my forward apologies. to next my week. My apologies for not sharing my screen story. <laughs> <laughs> not a problem at all. Thank you ever so much everyone. <laughs>